Hey everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library. I'm Dama Tamanawala, you know my co-host Garrett McGillivray, and today we're joined by Chief City Planner uh, for the City of Toronto and Executive Director uh, Greg Lintern. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Looking forward to a good chat. Yeah, uh-huh. us, us too. Good. Um, so before we jump into everything, we want to get right into the detail. You got a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Big yeah. city. We're here for about, we got four hours booked with them. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of time. Yeah. It's not enough. <laughs> um, um, can you tell us a little bit about, just for context, a little bit about how you got to where you are as the chief planner for the city of Toronto? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, should I tell you about my grade 10 uh, urban geography class? As, as much as you want to tell yeah. us, <laughs> you're willing to divulge? Yeah. yeah. To actually, you. actually, um, I think I could trace my interest in city planning to my grade 10 urban geography class. Mm. Uh, maybe at that time I want to be architect or maybe a pilot or all those things that kids think about what they want to be. But uh, I got inspired by, by that, I would think specifically. And from that point on, for me, it was pretty clear that I wanted to uh, kind of work on cities, whatever that meant, meant at that point in time. Mm-hmm. I can remember a project we did where you had to design a city and kind of thinking, oh, this is really cool, and uh, really never looked back. I kind of had a clear line of sight that that's what I wanted to do. Um, but, uh, you know, 35 years later, I look back and it's, it's just a lot of hard work and, you know, um, being interested in what, what uh, uh, comes at you when you do this uh, work and all the change that you get to see and I do like the fact that um, you you uh, experience you know the routine of city of cities but you also experience especially in Toronto a lot of change and I like thinking about the problems and the challenges that come with that change like it's something that I like or I would say that I love it so it keeps you it keeps you infatuated i would hope so you're the head of the pyramid right <laughs> yeah. now, so i'm yeah, very glad so. that you love it <laughs> that's what we want that yeah. is you gotta love it that is also remarkable when i think about what i was doing in grade 10 and the problems that what I was were you doing about. uh not thinking about selling my real estate or selling not quite real, yet. yeah i was already i had sold my first <laughs> building and yeah, then i did knew. his first deal i did my yeah, yeah. exactly uh, no, we won't. We won't dive down that rabbit hole. But, um, <laughs> but okay. So, and so now you've been at the working with the city of Toronto for how long now? Uh, Thirty-five years in different capacities, different roles. Right. You know, everything from the photocopier machine on up to the chief planner. What I what I'm doing today. But I worked in the different geographies of the city, uh, suburbs, downtown, different kinds of projects. So it's. It's never been without a change for me personally as well mm-hmm. and professionally, which helps you in, in any career. Mm-hmm. I think that, that kind of uh, change up is good for you. So I've had that opportunity at the city, which is one of the selling points of working for the city is being able to do different things and mm-hmm. still working in the organization. Right. That's a pretty unique thing, just having like ground up knowledge of like an organization, like the city is an organization, yeah. but like seeing it from all sorts of different angles because it's easy mm-hmm. for somebody to come in by doing like an urban planner consulting in Chicago and then just being like, hey, I'm chief city planner now of Toronto type of thing. And it's like, well, you don't truly know the city, like, you know, cities, but like, you don't know their urban feel as somebody that's sort of been doing it for like 35 years. And, and, you know, some of that's transferable. You talk, I talk to planners and architects and development people from cities all over the world. And there is a lot of commonality in, in what we're challenged with. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of that is definitely transferable, but then there's a lot of good local knowledge that also really comes mm-hmm. in handy. Mm-hmm. So just speaking from sort of a more higher level perspective, a lot of planners have that I've at least talked to have certain philosophies because mm-hmm. some might be more hardliners on transit and just, you know, trying to get that right off the ground. And that's their main focus. Some people are more um, worried about intensification and increasing densities across you know, different markets, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. What would your philosophy be? My philosophy uh, planning. As a planner, <laughs> yes. And this isn't about uh, philosophers. Uh, I would say, you know, I look at it 
uh, and I've talked about this in different um, forums that I've been in over the last couple of years, I try to talk about it from a values-driven point of view. And the approach that you bring to city planning or problem solving. Um, so I've identified some values, and you could have your own value set as a as a professional. Um, but I look at uh, things like uh, humility. I talk to the staff, our staff, a lot about being able to uh, 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 be empathetic with with the population of the city of Toronto and understand their daily experience not to kind of project onto them but actually to listen to people and understand uh, deeply what they're experiencing uh, walk in their shoes i say that a lot uh, don't assume um, i talk a lot about um, generosity that mm. uh, remember that we're all you know we're all living here like 2.9 are we 2.9 million people now in the city of toronto uh, so we're already kind of living in this concentrated space. We're already already being very generous with our with our lives and our space. And uh, planners have to think about, you know, uh, uh, always talking to people about being maybe a little bit more generous you know, <laughs> with their space because we're growing and we're inviting more people to live here, and that's that's a challenge. Um, I talk about resilience a lot and how we've tackled problems. I think we have to be aware that we've been able to tackle problems. I'm a bit of an optimist when it comes to being able to tackle some of the difficult challenges that we've got. And resiliency from a climate change perspective is uh, enormous, but also resiliency in just your philosophy of, you'd ask about philosophy, your philosophy of life and knowing that you can solve problems, you have the capacity to solve problems. And finally, you know, I, I talk about perspective that we're in this, uh, fast-paced world where everybody wants an answer yesterday and uh, no one's got time for analysis yeah. and all that other stuff but planners actually need to spend time thinking uh, doing working on data uh, coming up with good advice a good solid advice good analysis uh, and and bringing perspective to the conversation everyone's kind of in a hurry for a solution mm -hmm. but sometimes it's good to take a little bit of time do a little bit of work for better outcomes uh, at the end of the day, so that it's a long, long answer to your philosophy question. But mm -hmm. I think it's important to to approach it from a values point of view, which is what I try to do. Yeah, you got to be human, and it's a city occupied by humans. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you talk about like being at the city for thirty five years? Can mm -hmm. you talk about uh, some of the major uh, shifts that we've seen over that time period in planning? Some of the major shifts, well, I mean, it's interesting to think about uh, the city um, and how we've grown, uh, population, uh, you know, you, you use the downtown as, as a bit of a, of a roadmap for that, and uh, I've been working at the city when things have been very quiet, you know, right. through recessions, for example, in the early 90s. Um, we've been on a real run since, since that time. Um, probably more than 20 years of growth. But what we're coming to realize that that is that that growth isn't happening evenly, that some parts of the city are, uh, you know, I would say challenged by lack of investment and lack of renewal. They're kind of plateaued. Um, and some areas of the city are kind of almost overheated mm -hmm. and have a whole different set of problems around providing the right kind of infrastructure to support that growth. Young and Eglinton, for instance. Young and Eglinton, mm -hmm. right. parts of the downtown. So um, you kind of, over the course of that period of time, we've kind of gone from, um, you know, a, more of a, of, a, of a, people used to say more of a provincial city over a long period of time to much more of a global city that has serious global challenges. And then inside of that is this Toronto story about this unevenness that, uh, that I focus on a lot because some of the change that's been happening is focused you know, where we have our transportation network, the subways. If you look at a map of Toronto, you see a heat map, literally, you see the development and activity centered around uh, the subway. But you see other areas of the city that don't have uh, good transit, for example, and there is a lot less hap happening in those areas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we also have a long kind of trend line around uh, income, 
and frankly racial segregation that people don't talk about as much here, but the data shows that uh, we're increasingly polarized around, uh, around neighborhoods that, uh, and again, it's, it's about where things are happening and not happening, but areas where um, uh, people are being more uh, separated by their income than they ever have been over mm -hmm. that 30 year period of time. So thinking, my job in thinking about that un unevenness is about what we can do in those areas to, uh, to turn that around. What kind of stuff can you do to basically turn around like a 30 year polarizing, you know, shift in yeah. one particular direction? Well, I mean, we've been talking a lot about transit expansion, mm -hmm. but I also use the word <coughs> mobility. So you think about mobility broadly, you think about, you know, walking, cycling, uh, certainly using personal vehicle, uh, transit of all modes, LRTs, buses, subways, um, regional rail. But you think about that as a mobility network and you graph that onto the city and you look for areas where mobility is weak, weaker than other areas. Uh, that tends to correlate with those areas that have been left behind. Mm -hmm. So one way to get at that is to invest more in mobility because that literally... Uh, becomes a rising tide that lifts other boats um, and brings that access to opportunity to more people than it does currently. Uh, if you use a principle of a 5, 10, 15 minute walk to a higher order transit, for example, and try to stretch that network more and more, um, then you will open up opportunity for more people who haven't traditionally uh, had that. You also open up housing opportunity housing development opportunity to areas that currently may not have the land value to support redevelopment. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys probably know all about pro formas in your business, but that is behind a lot of what's going on in, uh, in the land development business. And some of the math doesn't pencil out in areas of Toronto. Some of it, of course, you can make lots of money. Right. Um, but um, some areas, it, it, it doesn't attract the, the, the investment proposition, if you will. If you bring, uh, if you improve transit access, then you improve the opportunity to build housing, both both um, affordable and and not uh, and and market housing. But it's it's kind of a simple equation around if you improve the mobility network, you expand access to opportunity, you bring uh, more investment to more areas of the city, and I think you begin to turn that that trend around. Would on that note, would there ever be any consideration to just reduce development charges in certain areas of Toronto to kind of lead to that expansion or, you know, at least act as a catalyst? Yeah, I mean, that, that the, the DC, uh, I would say that's been debated. Right. Uh, there are different schools of thought on uh, varying DCs to provide incentives. Uh, Toronto has never gotten into that business heavily. Um, we've we currently do not charge development charges for affordable housing, rental affordable housing. Right. Um, and that's the one incentive that we have to lower the per unit cost. Uh, other, other fees and charges are also exempt. So um, projects like um, uh, our open door program, for example, where we, we package up or bundle up a range of incentives to lower the per unit cost for an, uh, uh, development of affordable housing. Um, but the other side of the DC coin is about infrastructure, and um, the city has uh, a 10-year capital plan uh, right. to support growth. So if you want to start giving holidays for development charges, uh, you got to find another way to pay for it. Right. And uh, so that's the kind of tension you're smiling, but that is the tension in the, in the discussion, is that we don't want to leave kind of livability behind. Well, let's build housing, but you got to think about all the other things that come with housing to build uh, what we call complete communities. So you need the pipes, you need the roads, the parks, the community centers, the daycares to, you know, uh, make sure that you're building a livable community. If you only build housing uh, because you want to, you know, have a holiday on charges, right? then what are you going to do to pay for all the other stuff? And we seem to be really good here at the city about growing housing, you know, we're especially on the market side, not mm -hmm. so good on the affordable side. 
but um, we struggle with keeping up on the infrastructure demands. We're always a little bit behind the eight ball on that. People are always saying we don't have enough transit or they're worried about uh, the number of parks that we have in the city and things like that, especially in our high growth areas. Right. So, so you got to watch that, uh, and uh, I, you'll never hear me saying that we, we don't grow without growing the infrastructure. Right. It's, uh, it's, it's funny asking you these questions because, like, we obviously have so many questions, but you've obviously thought about all of this stuff <laughs> Once for in a, a long time. <laughs> um, okay. it will be actually interesting because we're going to be speaking with uh, options for homes. Mm -hmm. and right. I think in a month or something like that. Yeah. So we'll get the, yeah. the lo load down on all affordable rental uh, units. R right. Them. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, the market isn't building affordable housing mm -hmm. um, per se uh, by our definition. So, um, and that's, that is, that's the challenge in a city, in a global city like Toronto. It's no different really than some of the other challenges that cities like London or other mm -hmm. cities have. We're kind of in that family now of cities that have a big global challenge on their hands with affordability. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I take the view that we can't supply our way to affordable housing. We, we have to have a more direct role for um, some sort of incentive-based um, package um, around relief from fees. Um, which we do with Open Door in exchange for uh, affordable. But more directly, you know, w there were decades a long time ago now where there was a direct government role in, in supporting the construction of affordable. Um, and the market simply isn't doing that on its own. So there has to be more of an investment from the provincial and federal government. Uh, the city is trying to do its part with its, uh, an example of that is the Housing Now uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, initiative where we're taking city land and we're putting it on the market. Uh, I think the first sites are, uh, have been put out there. Mm. Uh, we're actually leading the zoning piece, so we're pre-zoning, which I think reduces the uh, uncertainty for the market. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, But in exchange for that, we are saying you got to build us a certain number of units of affordable. And that's the kind of business terms that we're putting out to the market. And we'll see what kind of interest we get from that. But we think that's another way that we can play a direct role, but we would like the provincial and federal government to also play a direct role mm -hmm. in, in advancing, um, you know, whether it be through their own land or, or, or other uh, government-supported uh, programs to see the construction of affordable. With, uh, with that in mind, so, you know, obviously there have been even recent changes such as Bill 108, which I yeah. hope we can dive into. Um, but, you know, like uh, the deferral of development charges is one thing, right? But, uh, but how do you, um, actually a better question, mm. the election was last night. Mm. Um, <laughs> Jeez. How do you, how do you, um, do you, do you foresee any changes coming with uh, Justin Trudeau's new term or his interactions with uh, our premier and then their interactions with the city? Well, uh, I think the, the mayor released a statement last night uh, just uh, putting it on the record again that uh, the city, from our perspective, needs support um, building transit. Um, and areas that I'm involved with, his letter mentioned a number of things, but certainly support building transit and advancing the transit network and uh, support with affordable housing. So those, you know, those are kind of our razor focused issues mm -hmm. that we feel uh, there is a significant role for the federal government to play. And that's, uh, you know, that's the conversation that we've been having. We've gotten support and we want to continue to get the support from the federal government to advance that. Okay. Um, in terms of like the affordable housing front, like, is there any thought to like making it easier to rezone properties to apartment based uses? To obviously increase supply and yeah. thereby, you know, yeah. de raising down demand, potentially lowering the inexorbent yeah. cost uh, to rent a one bedroom. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> that's about housing, no kidding. you know, expanding the choice that's out there for, <coughs> for Torontonians or future residents. We had 77,000 people come to Toronto in 2018. So we're growing. Um, and we project, um, 
upwards of you know close to a million people by 2041 new people and sorry the city of toronto not city of toronto, toronto. Uh, just you know the 416 wow yeah okay. so it's a lot and yeah. uh so what can we do you know about that and, and you mentioned one part of the toolkit mm -hmm. which is uh pre-zoning which i'm a great believer in i think you bring certainty to the discussion for the residents of a neighborhood let's say you have a discussion on about their main street and you say you know we're going to work on uh, a vision for that neighborhood for mid-rise buildings uh, and you have that discussion with with the neighborhood and you put in place and you pre-zone mm -hmm. uh, we've actually done that um, i think 19 of 25 avenue studies we've done we have pre-zoned that avenue segment and you can see places like St. Clair, for example, where uh, the, there's as a right zoning for mid-rise, which is between five and 11 stories, depending on the width of the street. Right. But you'll see like nine, 10, 11 story buildings on St. Clair, where the zoning's already in place. And that brings, you know, the expectation for the community is they understand what they're gonna get going forward into the future. And the ex expectation for the development side of the equation is that they know what they're gonna get. Mm -hmm. So you, you hopefully reduce speculation. You know, the land value is set around the expectation that the zoning provides. And you make the process more simple because, you know, you may need a minor variance or site plan. But really, yeah. it's not a big deal to get that project going quickly and get it to market. So I definitely believe that's part of the toolkit is pre-zoning as much as we can. Um, you see the cranes in the city, you know, I don't know what the last count was, 237, I think I checked some website somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of mid-rise and tall buildings under construction, by far and away the most in North America, like by a country mile. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the um, so, you know, people see, yeah, they see the tall buildings, but, and we, we're getting most of the unit production out of, out of the tall buildings, I grant you that. We're getting a hefty amount out of... Um, the pipeline for mid-rise, I think around 30, 35,000 units right now in the pipeline. Um, there are other things we can do, though, with pre-zoning on a much smaller scale about making it easier, for example, for secondary suites. So we've changed the zoning bylaw to make that permitted citywide. Uh, you, can, you know, as long as you have a good architect and check the building code, I always say. <laughs> Uh, you need you the can, fire escapes. You need your, absolutely, 100%. Uh, but uh, you can build, uh, you can include a second suite in your house with no parking as of right in Toronto. Okay. Uh, that's new. And I think you there's also... You can build a laneway suite yeah, as well. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, you can yeah. build a laneway suite now as of right if you have laneway access, mm -hmm. obviously. No parking again. Uh, so we're, on a small scale, you know, again, you see the cranes, but we're trying to do something right across the spectrum of need and choice to make it uh, uh, as, you know, as, uh, as uh, productive as possible for the, you know, the economy to produce housing. Mm -hmm. It's Do not a panacea, but it, again, <laughs> we're, we're trying to make that more and more um, variable or address the variables more and more in more different ways than we can yeah. in the and past than we did in the past. And Greg, do you know how many people are, I guess, as of right, but is there some way that you can measure how many people are taking advantage of the laneway yeah, uh, actually, we, we just had a, a check-in uh, yesterday, I think, or today, and um, it's only been in place for one year, like 12 months, literally, uh, and we've got about just over 50 building permits issued. So for something brand new uh, and about maybe 115-odd inquiries, like working their way through the review process, right. so for something that's brand new for Toronto, I'd say that's pretty good. It's not going to produce, you know, thousands of units overnight. That's why I go back to that word I used earlier about you yeah, got to yeah. keep things in perspective. But um, it will produce, uh, I think, over time, more and more interest and become more the norm to see that type of thing. And uh, whether you're, you know, you're aging in place and you got kids out, out the back in your laneway suite or you want to put your parents out there and live <laughs> in the house or... You like your relatives, or, you, or maybe you just want to rent uh, to supplement your mortgage. It, it opens up something that wasn't previously available. Mm -hmm. You'd always, you, and you can do a secondary suite as well, it, let's say in your basement or whatever. So uh, again, it, we're, we're trying to open that up and make it uh, more permissive.
Mm-hmm. So okay. two points on that. First, my brother actually wants to do that exactly oh, yeah? sweet thing because he's a ver- he's a minimalist, <laughs> and like. He doesn't use his upstairs. He wants to live in it. Yeah, he wants to live in it with his wife and his daughter, and he's just like, screw it, and then just rent his house. He's a semi-detached near, like, Christy Pitts, so it's like a perfect spot. He's probably got a laneway there. Yeah, no, he has one. Yeah. Um, Second, I believe I saw a laneway suite for sale in the... I don't know if... Can they be for sale? Can they be severed and sold? So, one of our conditions... Great question. Because of this issue with uh, changing the character of neighborhoods, there's always a bit of attention around uh, land severances. Mm-hmm. So our laneway suite uh, permission um, requires it to be tethered to the house and mm-hmm. not severed. Okay. So in that respect, it supports a rental, more of a rental choice. Yeah. We can't zone for tenure, but we can certainly set it up so that uh, that's the option, really. Uh, you can sell your house with the laneway yeah. suite. Yeah. It's but um, we are not, you know, what you're, what you're asking there is... Uh, another tension in the city, which is around um, the whole real estate uh, world and what some people call the financialization of housing, mm. which is, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it was, it was a home. Uh, and, and, and 30, 40 years today, it's your retirement. Mm-hmm. You guys know all about that probably. Um, oh, yes. And uh, so it's become an investment tool more and more. And this has created a real tension around, uh, around how people perceive uh, the housing challenge. Uh, right. Some people perceive it as a, as a right. Um, and when you think about it, in a, in a, in a society like ours, uh, I think housing is a right. Um, it, certainly people who are, are challenged with housing options uh, would see it that way. Uh, and, and when we think of it only as an investment um, and buying and selling and flipping and all the different things that go on with real estate these days, um, we get away from, I think, what the public interest is, which is about uh, meeting the housing need of the population. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, in planning, there's always that tension between the public interest and the private interest. It's essentially a big negotiation that's always going on about what happens with the marketplace and what um, what we do with rules and regulations mm. to temper uh, the market and you know soften the edges sometimes of the, of the mm-hmm. market so housing is a big place where all, where, all, where you see that playing out more and more mm-hmm. um, I got one speaking of uh, <laughs> We don't have an order to any of these, so we just kind of jump in. But uh, speaking to changing the characteristics of neighborhoods, actually, I have a two-part question. Uh, when we talk about avenues, uh, yeah. a lot of, like I grew up in the beaches, Queen Street East kind yeah. of neighborhoods. We have a lot of those six-story buildings from Daniels Corp. And actually, you don't have that many in the beach, but anyway. Not too many. It's getting, yeah. getting, getting there. there. Yeah. More Leslieville yep, kind Leslieville. of area right yeah. now. Um, it, but what we found, like at least from a sales perspective, is that a lot of these developers are they can't make the economics work. They can't make the numbers work mm-hmm. for just six stories. Is there any, um, you know, is there any consideration to expand that to a higher amount of store? Maybe nine, nine to twelve. I know. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier about about putting in place as a right zoning so that everybody understands you know, what you're going to get right. out mm-hmm. of a development proposition. And uh, we've reviewed different avenues, and there are different scales. Um, Ossington, for example, uh, there's a little pocket there. It's quite popular. Um, depending on what block you're on, it could be four or five or six stories that's permitted, for example. Right. Uh, in the beach, it's the same. Parts of the beach are, are quite special, and people think about it differently. Uh, and again... Four or five or six whereas up on the danforth it's wider uh and it can support the the lot depths are different and it can support slightly taller or you go to a shepherd for example or a wilson avenue and you get um even more opportunity there so what we try to do is size the permission for the context right um and but at the same time bring some certainty for both the residents and and the development industry so we don't get into this kind of crazy site-by-site negotiation all the time. And it, um, 
I mean, you know, the density that you can achieve on an avenue, just think about it. Instead of going up, you're spreading it out. Right. And it's going to play it over a longer period of time. But again, you, we've got, we've got um, tens of thousands of units that are proposed or, or being constructed on the avenues. So it'll, you know, it, it, they're transforming. We've got old Victorian main streets in the former city of Toronto. We've got broad suburban avenues in the city of Toronto. There's 140 kilometers of avenues out there that can support intensification so hmm. uh, and we're doing our level best to kind of um, have those conversations and set that up for success it's actually interesting having the pre-zoning concept because <clears throat> when a lot of people buy land they buy it on speculative value because right. they're just assuming right. they're like we're going to get an 80-story condo on this baby Seems and like, obviously well, that's what everyone wants yeah and every, <laughs> everybody wants they're just like we're just going to hammer them hammer the city yeah. down hammer the OMB yeah. yeah but then when you have mine's hard, the key piece that's what they yeah. say yes yeah, exactly. I've heard that or I've got the landmark site yeah. exactly <laughs> really best site it's in a the city whole full universe. of landmark sites yeah. I know I've heard them all but then having that pre-zoned element and the hard cap on, say, like, this is a six-story site yeah. that eliminates all speculative value for it. And mm -hmm. then, therefore, because the major issue why a lot of mid-rise buildings don't work is because land is priced at, like, high-rise density land everywhere. Because That's everybody's right. like, no, 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 you can get yeah, a you're condo welcome. here, 100%. You know, you, property, uh, you know, a lot of our main streets are owned by, and you probably know this, individual owners. Mm -hmm. Families that have owned the properties for decades. And they're income properties. They've got a viable restaurant. They've got another business that, you know, and they're, they're kind of on, they run their, their life on an income model. That's their income. Mm -hmm. So a lot of land uh, sits productively in, in that income model for a long, long time. Um, you know, somebody passes away, the, the business shuts, the, the family decides we don't want it anymore. So you see that dynamic in Toronto mm -hmm. a lot uh, lately where where property gets handed down and uh, comes into uh, an option for, for redevelopment. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see that kind of dynamic across our main streets. Um, or you see, you know, transformations happening where a street used to be a street full of car dealerships, for example, but, or gas stations and other things that we don't see as much of these days. So some of those sites, which are really good sites, uh, come online for uh, mid-rise development. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you asked me earlier about this transformation over 30 years, and that's one of the things that you slowly begin to see is that uh, intensification taking place, which is, I think, really positive for those neighborhoods because you've got a chance. Let's say you're in a neighborhood in a house. You really love it. All your friends are there. Your doctor's there. Your dentist is there. Your, your, uh, your book club's there. Um, you're getting older. You don't want to move out. You want to find a new place to live. In, in that area, right. uh, and so mid-rise or maybe a laneway suite or whatever is uh, an option for you to stay there, stay in your social network, stay close. Maybe you don't own a car anymore, right? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, it makes a lot of sense for a lot of people if you provide greater housing options uh, on that basis. Uh, can we take a dive into Bill 108? I guess so. All right. I thought you had and a two-part question. Era two part oh my second part of the question was it uh, was why uh, i didn't ask any follow-up questions Dana. but okay man <laughs> um the second part of the question was not as serious but like because you kind of answered it already mm -hmm. but you know you see avenues like mm -hmm. the danforth for instance that actually have a subway line right there yeah um you know how is do you see a future where that is high-rise territory and and why not you know, yeah. uh, obviously neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would just say that there's equally um, there's an equally valid uh, opportunity there to spread the density out, and uh, the coexistence of uh, our low-rise neighborhoods is with with change along the avenues is something that you're beginning to see across mm. across Toronto. Um, and again, it's it is like lying down uh, a tall building across a uh, a longer stretch. Um, I think the tall building uh, intensity that you see in the city is more appropriate for the, the, the centers that we planned at Young and Eglinton or North York Center, Scarborough, Tobacco, the waterfront, right. the downtown. There's lots of opportunities for that. Um, but there's, there is, uh, there are more, there's more than one way to create density. 
uh, and you can again you can create it at a really low scale uh, uh, intensification when I talk about the generosity that people have to endure in the city um, we've got to do it carefully and uh, not haphazardly I think people expect that we're going to have uh, density and growth but they're going to as I said earlier they're going to expect the infrastructure that comes along with it and you cannot hope to keep up with that level of growth if you don't have a degree of planning that goes on and coordination with the provision of infrastructure I think if you've got 80 story buildings popping up uh, everywhere I think you've got anarchy <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and nobody likes that no right um, okay did you have a question or did you Go on. Go on, David. I can go? All right. Uh, okay, so Bill 108, this this big mm-hmm. bill um, was released in, in June, right? Something like that. Yes. This early in the yeah. summer. Um, to do with the More Homes, More Choice Act yes. from Premier Ford. So um, uh, the, the bill has a lot of big claims about reducing uh, the time that the development is going to take uh, or entitlement is going to take to go through the process. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know i but but not too much detail so i'll rattle off a few questions okay um how how how, how uh how is the inclusionary zoning going to be taken into account okay so inclusionary zoning which is uh, basically um uh, seeing a a percentage of every uh, housing project um produce a component of affordable housing is yeah. basically what it means and has been utilized in many cities around North America. The legislation um, continues the permission that the previous bill had, Bill 139, uh, from the previous government, so Bill 108 didn't change it. Okay. Uh, it does limit its application to certain um, uh, major transit station areas, which are station areas in proximity or close proximity to existing or planned transit stations five to eight hundred meters um and it uh or or in an area where we have a um, community permit system or development permit system right so it's set up some uh, it continues the basis for permitting inclusionary zoning but it restricts it more than we would like we would like it to be more permissive the other uh, issue with inclusionary zoning that the government um, has put forward is that they have also um, changed uh, the municipal um, the provisions of the Planning Act that uh, how, how how we secure uh, and pay for municipal services. So inside Bill 108 is a change to um, three tools: our Section 37 provisions, uh, the section 42 provisions, which is the parkland provisions. Every development pays parkland levy. Right. And thirdly, uh, DCs, soft DCs, so certain kinds of DCs. Uh, The Planning Act change rolls all those three together into something new called a community benefits charge. Right. And um, it's called the Community Benefits Authority. We have to do a background study to set up what that community benefits uh, authority is going to be. Okay. And that will have an impact on inclusionary zoning because inclusionary zoning and the CBC or community benefits charge, they all go on your pro forma. And we want it to work. So we are in the process of waiting for the government to produce the regulations behind the CBC charge so that we can understand the impact on the pro forma so that we can do the calculations to um, basically roll out an inclusionary zoning uh, package that makes sense. There's, there's no point in putting in something where we've got everybody screaming at you that it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So it has to ways. happen in a certain, <laughs> it's complicated and it's finances, but it has to happen in a certain order. So the legislation has been enacted, but the regulations have not been produced. Okay. So until the regulations are out and we can do the calculations, we can figure out how it's going to impact everyone. We've been uh, consulting about inclusionary zoning and we're going to be advancing um, ideas about it, but we can only take it so far before we see the rest of the deal 
on the CBC charge. If all that makes sense. Yeah, it you, doesn't. You, you get an A. You, you kind of <laughs> yeah, you, you answered like three or four of my questions there in one. Yeah, it's, it's all related. Are, are there any early, so we're still a ways away then, yeah, but yeah. are there any early seeds of maybe surprises that no, I don't think so. We published in uh, June a proposal for inclusionary zoning. So people can see that on our website. There is a report that outlines an approach, right. a general approach for inclusionary zoning. Um, and it is kind of mindful of the impact while at the same time, uh, you know, the city approves uh, on average about 21,000 housing units a year. If we could get a small percentage of that as affordable, we'd be doing really well on that uh, shortfall that we're confronted with by not producing affordable housing. Remember, the market's not producing affordable housing, so we need that government nudge, uh, regulatory nudge through inclusionary zoning to really convert some of that juice into uh, affordable product so that um, more people can, uh, more people who are in need of affordable housing, can their needs can be met. Okay. Um, I stop me if I keep going too far, but uh, doesn't he get to ask a question? He does, but he's he takes longer. No, I don't take longer. I'm just I'm just letting it all more sink thoughtful. In. Yeah. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Well, no, because like affordable housing is is so very important. Because my my girlfriend's sister actually works in London. She works as part of the the housing. I don't know what the organization is called, but she assists yeah, council people or something, yeah. getting people into affordable housing units, mm -hmm. basically, that are in need. And like the people that she deals with, I'm just like, wow, like they have not had the dice roll the right way yeah. for their life. Yeah. And like they're struggling and the affordable housing stock is so very limited. Yeah. And it's like there's there's a wait list of like 500 people trying to get into these things. And it's like, I mean, we, we have to work hard to retain what we've got. We have hundreds of thousands of rental units in Toronto, mm -hmm. actually. But they were all built decades ago. Yep. Uh, some of them are actually coming under threat for redevelopment. So we have regulations that require their replacement. Yep. So we work really hard at retaining what we have as, as part of the strategy. Um, if you redevelop a site that has an apartment building on it, um, most of them small apartment buildings, we get their replacement as part of the approval. That's mm -hmm. the way our uh, policies and regulations work. Um, but we have to grow it too, right? right. So you retain and, you, and you, you try to expand it. So y you're identifying an issue in London that's very similar to here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the... the, the the Ontario government and the city, the former city and metro government, actually built, you know, housing decades ago. Um, those are generally the Toronto community housing sites that we have. They're Canada's largest landlord. I think it's 60,000 units. Um, but some of those sites are revitalization sites. So Regent Park, for example, is another example of how the city can um, use its land resource um, provided that we, you know, replace and renew those units. And we've been doing that in, in a number of um, what we call revite sites. Alexandra Park, you know, Tridell, I think, is working there. Yep. Daniels has been working at uh, Regent. Um, I think it's Metropia that's working up at Lawrence um, Heights. Great opportunities to kind of reintegrate those housing communities into their surroundings uh, build new services new community centers right a lot of those guys new how new housing market housing retail so you're kind of re-knitting those communities back into their uh, into their surrounding communities a lot of those guys are doing great jobs too. yeah like yeah you know no, i mean they're winning the awards and they're they're um i mean i think people see it for what it is now which is a great opportunity I mean, these these buildings were built 40 50 60 years ago they you know, the roofs are shot, the furnaces are gone, uh, the windows are bad. You're either going to economically, you know, do all that work um, in a building that really isn't the best mm -hmm. for housing, especially housing families, or you're going to rebuild them from scratch and uh, utilize that uh, land resource, I think, more effectively. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're intensifying all of those sites. Those, you know, the population of Regent Park is going way up. Uh, I think 17,000 people are going to live there 
wow. when it's all said and done. Uh, so, and, 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 and you can see similar growth in some of the other areas. So uh, again, it's a, it's a really great opportunity to partner with uh, the private sector and get some uh, good community building done. Just narrowing in specifically to the rental replacement units. So mm-hmm. when somebody obviously becomes a developable site and then they take down, say, 15 types of units, everything, and they build a condo, mm-hmm. um, then they're furnishing, say, 15 new rental repla- like rent- referral yeah. rental units in that building. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a timeline in which they, they don't have to be affordable anymore, or is it like for life? type of thing for the light the light yeah so that's generally negotiated um yeah. i think those terms um uh, vary between probably 10 and 25 years okay um and those situations all vary okay well i'm trying to think of, of what else omb yeah yeah that, great point how was the how was the transition from um the omb to lpat back to the the new lpat how, how has that affected you guys uh, you know, I think it's too early to tell. The the uh, the bill um, just came into effect uh, just in September 2019. Um, so these these things, you, you know, they're very subtle, and you don't uh, w- you don't notice um, the changes like a light switch going off, uh, like you would with a light switch going off. Right. Um, you know. My focus has always been on working with developers, and we've got a lot of really good uh, examples across the city of really positive um, collaborations with communities and developers. I talk a lot about Honest Eds or The Well or um, other projects across the city where we've met you know, the expectations of the community and we've met the aspirations of the developer right uh and the omb stays over there and that's the way you build the city you you kind of you know you want to go off to the omb uh maybe you know um that's necessary sometimes but i would rather focus my energy and my efforts and my resources on a collaboration where again i think we've demonstrated over and over again that we can get stuff done and uh and grow the city. The city is growing, 273 cranes, so something's going right. Right. Uh, and, you know, the subtleties good, of... Good work, by the way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but the, the subtleties of the OMB and the LPAT, uh, I'd rather, you know, save that for for uh, those who feel that you can get, you know, have problem solves through an adversarial process. I'm, I'm less right. interested in that kind of conversation. Right. Even on the basis, I was just thinking of like your prior comments on mobility and stuff like that, because I had a selfish question in here talking about uh, traffic congestion for high residential or high rise residential <laughs> neighborhoods. Yes, <laughs> you must live. You must live yeah, in one. I live in yeah. Liberty Village. Oh, I live yeah. in Liberty Village, <laughs> and then I was always looking you at that corner. You ride your bike to work? No. Uh, streetcar. You can start there. I right. walk and then streetcar. Okay. So the King Street pilot project yeah, is you a must dream. Like that. Yeah, oh, you must like goodness. that. Yeah, you must like that. Twenty minutes to work. It's yeah. just a, it's wonderful. Yeah, but. You almost have a bridge too. That's that was the, the point bridge, that I was going to make. The new bridge open or the the, other, the, the second the bridge? Did. Yeah, the one on the, the east Duro side. Street Bridge. Yeah, and yeah. then there's the one that's yeah. in Liberty Village proper that's yeah. just opening up. But like that clues into the fact of the mobility of yeah. having pedestrian yeah. foot traffic. Yeah. With the higher residential neighborhood, even though the streets are unfortunately narrow and they're locked by bridges on both sides, mm-hmm. where you can't really expand the road at all. But, you know, the pedestrian footbridges will alleviate a lot of that traffic as well as, you know, bicycles and stuff like that. So, just right. it's a, not a question, it's a okay. comment. Because right. my but question's already been an answered. Observation. You're yeah. not, okay. just, right. I mean, I was the, just like, wow, <laughs> that clued all in there. So, so you've answered your own question. Yes, no, because exactly. Because you just, you're just, we're just using the available finite space uh, mm-hmm. more smartly than yeah. we have before. And you think about moving people instead of counting cars Mm -hmm. if you change the metric to moving people Mm -hmm. um, you're going to make that road space a lot more efficient if you decide to use it differently and that's what we did with king street where you started counting the amount of space that's used up by cars um, and then amount number of people in them versus people on foot or using or in riding in a streetcar Mm -hmm. and you quickly see through the data 
that you're going to do a lot better and more efficiently moving people um, when you when you give the streetcar an edge, which is what we did with the design for for King Street. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful. So <laughs> it took a moment, but people are getting used to it. They're getting yeah, used right. to it. And, you know, Toronto is kind of a funny place when it comes to changing mindsets. Um, but these um, once these opportunities uh, uh, get run, we, we do a lot of pilots here in the city. It's kind of the Toronto way. But people, I think, come along and you kind of change the conversation um, bit by bit. And it's, it, once you get something on the ground here, I think it means a lot. Um, bike lanes are the same same mm-hmm. thing. I mean, people travel all over the world and they glow about bike lanes and separated cycle tracks in other cities. And then they come back here and they complain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I think people need to put two and two together a little bit more and understand um, the potential that we've got with that finite road space that we have, mm-hmm. using it more smartly and moving people. It's also about, you know, creating better places. We talked about livability earlier and, and making that street uh, more amenable to human beings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that's what it's all about. Um, which in turn, I think, supports the prosperity of the street and the investment that can come on that street. The restaurants in Toronto come and go, and I'm not in the restaurant business. So far from me to judge, but um, I think there's lots of opportunity, and we've seen that through the data, and it was important uh, using that data to evaluate the the uh, the impact of King Street. Mm-hmm. But we've seen uh, that level of variability on King Street be not unlike a level of variability on other streets. So we, we were kind of, I think, very careful and smart about how we went about um, coming to a conclusion that that was a, a really positive change for the city. Well, for sure. And, like, the power project has been on for a while now, and the restaurants haven't closed. Well, a few have come and gone, but I would yeah. say that restaurants come and go. And again, I'm not in that yeah. business, but I, I think but you it's get not that nor- normal activity in a big city like Toronto. Yeah. It's not a mass vacant street or something like that. It's like, it's still, people are still there. People are yeah, still moving. It, you know, what, what needs to happen next is we need to uh, improve, continue to improve the public realm and mm. think about the street differently. And, uh, uh, but we, we can't forget the, the metric, like your, your 20 minutes to work, you said, and we can't forget that we've, we've made it, um, you know, quicker for people to get to work. But I think most importantly, it's more reliable. So you can now, um, you know, almost like walking, it used to be faster walking, mm-hmm. but you can, uh, decide to leave at eight o'clock for a eight thirty meeting and you'll know that that streetcar is coming uh, on a four-minute interval. Mm -hmm. Um, That's really important. That's important during the day for um, the local mobility around the downtown. Um, uh, And that's the same way with bike share and some of these other things that we can do to give people options to move about and meet the needs of their daily routine and daily life. You know, think about it through that lens and um, make that mobility network work for them. We don't have... It's 6.08. Oh. Oh. This requires enough time here. Okay. So maybe Can first, I, Preya, do you have any questions? No. We won't lose talking about the nuts that I had. Okay. okay. Just wanted to <laughs> make sure that you're included. Can I ask you? Because I'm, I'm just... Have, I still have so many questions and mm. to be uh, careful of your time. Uh, can you just give me like maybe one sentence answers for these questions? I can try. Okay. Um, <laughs> w- is what do you think about the Portlands? Is there anything on the docket from the city? Uh, one sentence answer on the Portlands. Two, two <laughs> a fifty-year, a fifty-year kind of plan. That's the sentence. Yeah, That's okay. the yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? The river is under construction. Uh, I think one of the most remarkable transformations in the city's history of putting the river mouth back uh, where it, where it was for centuries. Mm-hmm. You know that's the way it used to work and. For a pause of about 100 years, we had this industrial uh, portlands, but we're, we're putting the river back, and that is going to be transformational. People are going to go there within five years and see something completely new, and that's going to set the stage for um, new mixed-use communities, um, Villiers Island. But also, um, you know, we are continuing to see the investment in film studio industry and and all the economic changes that are coming with that there's a lot of room it's deceiving 
there's a lot of room in the portlands for gradual incremental change so there's enough room for um, you know building new housing on Villiers Island but there's also still enough room for more studio expansion so we're seeing we're going to see both right. and and that's going to play over the next couple of decades right and and still retained by the city with you know hundred year leases and that kind of thing uh i don't know that's for uh, smarter that's minds than longer than, than longer me. than one yeah. sentence okay yeah, yeah. um uh what else did i have uh oh you have a few million dollars where do you put it in the city this is a, that's an investment question. Yes, where would you personally? Invest? Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you know, like personally. real estate investment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, geez, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I mean, I'll leave houses. that. I'll, I'll, yeah. leave, I'll leave that to to you guys to uh, to sort out. I'm in the the public sector, and if you're going to give me uh, as as a as a chief planner, I'm going to take a couple of million dollars that you're going to give me, and I'm going to invest it in high impact, low cost. Uh, I'm going to. I'll tell you where I'm going to spend it. I'm going to spend it on the bus rapid transit network <laughs> to make people move around more quickly and, and easily in the suburbs. Okay. Okay. Fair. Um, today was transit day, you mentioned, or tomorrow's? Uh, tomorrow is a executive committee for the uh, transit package, yeah. Okay. What is happening there? Anything any, well, the big? province has proposed four priority transit investments. The Ontario line, which is a version of what the city was thinking about with the north and south relief line, mm -hmm. uh, extending from um, the Science Centre over to Ontario Place, right. down through the alignment of uh, the rail network, in part. Um, also, the Scarborough subway extension, uh, a three-stop version of, of that. Uh, an extension north of the Young Line to Richmond Hill and the Eglinton West uh, LRT extension. So those are all projects that the province is going to prioritize and advance. Um, they have announced uh, and we've reported on the, uh, the fact that they no longer wish to upload the subway uh, system. Uh, so we, we think um, that in total the the way to go forward is to uh, is to work with them, and we're recommending. Uh, we've done an initial review, especially of the Ontario line, because parts of it are new. We've done an initial line uh, review of that, and we think we can uh, recommend it in principle. There's a lot of detailed work to do, especially where it carves through some of the East End. Um, but we think there's enough there to work with them collaboratively to advance what's sorely needed in the city, which is uh, uh, expansion of the transit network. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, that report sets up a number of uh, recommendations for agreements. You know, we need to work with them, but we need to have uh, agreements about our relationship so that we all know what each other is doing and our roles and responsibilities. So that report outlines all of that. Okay. Um, I, I was just going to go for the last one to be careful. Go for it. All right. Uh, so this one's not written on the on the sheet, but this question we ask all our guests is called okay. the three truths. Uh, so, right. Get ready. Okay. Uh, so imagine years from now, yeah. um, you know, you're a hundred years old and you lived a very successful life mm -hmm. and um, accomplished everything that you wanted to do personally and for the city of Toronto or wherever you might be at that time. A uh, hundred years from now. Uh, <laughs> Whoa. But, pretty old uh, <laughs> yeah it's very it's very successful life yeah. um but for whatever reason all of the interviews that you've ever done all of the books that you've ever written um they've all been erased and you have three short notes to pass on to your family and friends and the people who love you whoa about uh life or planning or whatever you want to think about yeah what would you put on those notes well, I would go back to my values. I'm pretty centered on, on um, how um, they're tried and true. And when you have a problem that you don't know the answer to, if you go back to the guidance that they can provide you, um, you'll find the answer, or you'll be able to locate someone who can help you find that answer. Uh, so I would definitely go back to, to those values. Um, you said there were three? Yep, three, yeah. <laughs> three short notes. Three short right. notes. So go back to your values. Um, you know, th those are pretty all-encompassing. So um, I, would, I would also emphasize, you know, multi-generational responsibility that you, that you are only here for a short time. Maybe it's 100 years, but uh, 
you've got that longer term, you've got to remember that you've got a longer term responsibility for people who come after you that you haven't met yet. You know, a lot of new people coming to Toronto. Uh, so think about, don't just think about yourself and don't just think about the here and now, but think really longer term. Uh, third one, third one, geez. It's not easy. <laughs> just remember to get a lot of sleep and, <laughs> and, and eat regular meals. <laughs> That's the best I can do. I think that was the opposite of what my brother said on this. <laughs> yeah, he did, yeah. yeah. He said sleep is for the weak or something <laughs> oh, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that was his thing, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. I, like, it's, it's so interesting um, how you think about city planning. And, uh, you know, obviously we're real estate guys and we, we think about the profit a lot of times, but there's so much more to consider. you got to expand your horizon. Well... Maybe. <laughs> Maybe, not not just yet, not just yet. There are many <laughs> bottom lines to there are <laughs> many bottom yet. lines to life, not just your profit. That's the quote of the year. Okay, yeah. uh, thank you so much. Thanks for coming. You're on. welcome. Thank you, Greg. Thanks.